we are uh, getting close to the end here. Um, we have one more homework, and uh, I, which I posted, but I'm going to uh, also have copies here with that. problems on the front and three on the back. And I'm just asking you, uh, for you to turn in problem one. And actually, the problems on the back are, are optional. I, I decided because uh, you know we had a guest speaker today, and we only have a couple more class meetings left, that um, I'm not going to cover controls in, uh, in, 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 in detail. There's just not enough time, and I, I didn't really have a, enough time to get my notes into a, you know, a form that I'm really happy with. Uh, but I did post them because it's the next topic. It's the one you all decided you wanted to do. So that's the topic for today. Um, but I'm not going to test you on it, or uh, we're not going to jump into the weeds with the controls. We've got, a, I think, enough now to bring us to the uh, carry us through. You've got the project that you're working on. And so I want to uh, spend the rest of the time today, I want to do some examples of uh, economic analysis. That's where I want to really finish out in detail. And then uh, as time allows next week, maybe we can talk about controls and some other, uh, some other stuff. I, controls, I really like controls, but um, I, I, I really struggled to develop a, you know, to write up my own material on controls. I, like I don't have examples in, in my notes like I do with my other sets of notes, so I really need to put some examples in there, and uh, so I might, I, I just need to spend a little more time working, working up those notes, but um, it is, uh, you're just knowing in general what some of the control loops look like, or for example, for a chilled water uh, system, for a, 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 a chilled water coil versus a heating coil, uh, how the control scheme is set up. So just kind of knowing in a qualitative sense how control the, the main control loops, what they look like, that's really sufficient for now. We don't need to get into calculating gains, you know, do, doing PID, quantitative analysis of PID loops and things like that. Um, I guess you did, did you, you did PID control in, uh, in, in, in machine design? I think machine design three. Yeah. Machine design three. Did y'all do like calculations of proportional gain and mm -hmm. integral, the integral and reset, things like that? Yeah, because um, those are we use those in, in HVAC. Not that we don't use derivative so much, but uh, proportional and integral PI control is very common. As is uh, you know on-off control is still quite common as well. Um, proportional. There's a lot of these systems are are you know relatively slow acting. Uh, you know, it takes time when you're changing the temperature of, 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 of uh, yeah, you're working through, yeah, these are rel generally relatively slow systems in terms of their process dynamics compared to other, lots of other applications. And so a lot of times you can get away with proportional control. But PI is usually sufficient to uh, control temperature and humidity, especially at a, in, in, in a reasonable manner. Um, but anyway, and then the sequencing part of it, that's kind of fun, looking at uh, control sequences and uh, motor startup and how, you know, how to stably start up and shut down and break down the system. <laughs> but I just need to do a little more. I uh, de develop my notes on that, or find uh, material that's already written. But I, I, I honestly, I can't find very much on uh, controls that's good for students and good for a learning environment. 
So anyway, let's, uh, what I'd like to do is, is um, focus on these first two problems in the homework, and uh, which really, that's at the, the heart of the, the notes on uh, economic analysis. And I have a couple of examples I want to do with you. Um, so I'm going to pass those out now. And we'll just work through uh, an example of a problem that's like homework problem one and, and one that's like homework problem two. Okay, so um, in economic analysis, of, uh, we're doing estimates of project costs in, uh, for the purpose of comparing alternatives, usually. Um, the, the method that we use is to uh, lay out our costs based on our, our, you know, our, the best estimate that we can come up with. And uh, generally, we, we know fairly well what our upfront cost is going to be. We look at all the equipment. And there are um, established procedures for estimating the, the cost of installation, the cost of startup, and commissioning, and things like that. We can usually get those pretty easily. So this cost uh, at time zero, in order to get this thing built, start it up, and turn it over to the owner, that's pretty <coughs> standard stuff, and we can do that pretty well. Where it becomes more difficult is estimating out costs uh, operating and maintenance costs, costs of fuel, electricity, energy, uh, across the life of the project. And the standard way to handle that is to try to, uh, 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 try, try to, try to, to uh, work our costs out over time into this, a series of equal annual net cash flows. These, these are called cash flows, these uh, little arrows. A downward arrow means that you're paying out. That's money that's, that is leaving you. An upward arrow is money that you're bringing in, so it's income. So income up and payments down. And uh, it's relatively simple to take a series of equal annual payments like that and then convert those to a present value. So you, you take all of these for however many years and you turn it into one number that you can add to the 6,000 and it gives you a present value for your investment. Um, now, this, in this case, we just have it looks like maintenance costs or maybe energy and maintenance together. And then at the end, sometimes we can uh, sell our equipment as salvage, or you know, if there's life left in them, you know, maybe somebody will, will buy the equipment, and that represents income at the end. And then we can start you know investing another system. So we would take uh, you know a couple or three alternatives. Usually it's going to be you know the deluxe model, you know with all the bells and whistles. Then there's going to be a standard, and then maybe there's a cheapo. You know if you want to uh, have have one that's going to cost the least up front, and you present those to the client. The client says, oh okay, well you know I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. I, I like having lower energy costs, or you know I want to. I'll pay more now so that I'll have lower energy costs and, and a, a greener project of less environmental footprint. Um, 
So the, the techniques that are introduced here really are how we take a, a series of cash flows like this and convert them all into a single number that represents the life cycle cost, the total cost of running this system from time zero out until we scrap it and start all over again. And uh, these w formulas here are formulas that allow you to take a value you know, monetary value at some point in time and turn it into a value at another point in time. And uh, probably the most, the easiest one to understand would be this one here where if we have, uh, you know, some amount now and we want to know how much that's going to be worth uh, in the future. Let's say uh, I have $100 now and I want to I want to uh, know what this is going to be, what its future value will be in one year. I would multiply $100 by 1 plus the interest rate and then raise it to the 1, which would be one year from now. If I have $100 and I want to know what it's worth in two years, I my discount rate, raise it to 2, and then multiply by 100 and so on. So this takes uh, this factor here takes a present value and converts it to a future value. You see this one is just does the opposite. It takes a future value and converts it into a present value. So you know $100 two years from now, what is that worth today? I would use this formula here. And these get a little more complicated. This would be um, given F, turn that into an annual series of equal payments. So let's say, uh, you know, hundred dollars in, in ten years. I want to have hundred dollars in ten years. I want to be able to go and pull hundred dollars out of this account. How much will I have to put into the account every year to get hundred dollars? I want to put equal amounts in every year for hundred years. So I could use this formula here. Whatever the interest rate is, n is ten. The interest rate, that's going to produce a number. I multiply that by 100, if I want $100, and that's going to tell me an, an annual amount I have to deposit over for 10 years in order to get $100 at the end of 10 years. Um, and, and, and so on. Here we have a, a future value given A. You know, if I, put in $100 into an account, $100 every year for 10 years, how much will be left? How much will be there after 10 years? I, this formula will help me calculate that. And if I have an annual amount, an equal annual amount like this, $210 for one, two, three, four, five years, how much is all of that worth if I convert it into a single number in the present. So present value of these payments to P given A, I will use this formula here. Now, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a pain in the neck to use these formula to make the calculations. And so there are tables that you can use like that look like this that will take a single interest rate. This is an example for 6%. And it does all the it's done all the calculations for you. It has all the factors here, and then it uh, it, it shows what the fact the value of the factor is for uh, every year from n equals one to one hundred. And uh, generally, this is what we do. We look these up in tables, or uh, actually now we can just use a spreadsheet because Excel has functions that will calculate these for you. Uh, if you're looking for the present worth of an annual amount, there's a function that you can just uh, use that function, or you can put the, the calculation in yourself, as I, as I did in the example spreadsheets that I posted. Instead of using the Excel function, I just hard-coded the calculation into the cell using the formula. Um, so there's just some examples here of how we, uh, how we can uh, use these formula to do time value calculations. Uh, now we need a discount rate. That, that's that's uh, my 
the discount rate is gonna be my personal, the value that I place on money in, uh, in the future relative to today, individuals have discount rates, but so too do organizations. The business will have a discount rate, and generally this will be whatever the going rate is on their savings. Like a, a business will, will hold its, uh, its, its, its retained earnings or its savings and various investment in, instruments like bonds or stocks or bank accounts, and those accounts will pay an interest, and that's money that's just sitting there, and so the business will look at what interest they're earning on that savings account, and they'll use that as their discount rate. They'll, 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 they'll reason that, okay, um, if I'm gonna invest in a new HVAC system, uh, I'm gonna value the money, that investment, in, uh, in the same way that I value the investment in my savings account. So if I'm earning 5% or 6% of my savings, I'm gonna use that five or 6%, I'm gonna discount my money going into the future for that, uh, for that investment. And different companies will have different interest rates um, in, that, in that sense. Um, and then there's the rate of inflation the general rate of inflation in the economy, and then there is a rate of inflation for various types of equipment that you might buy or for energy. Now generally in HVAC, um, we're mostly interested in energy costs. Those are the things that really hit us hard, and uh, energy costs tend to, to rise, and uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to predict how they will rise, but often we will project a rate of escalation in the cost of electricity or the cost of gas or what, whatever it is we have to purchase to run our system, and we'll build that into our analysis. Which means we have effectively have two interest rates. We have the discount rate, which is our personal our, our personal calculation of, of the future value of money, and then we have the interest, uh, the inflation rate on top of that. And we and the situations where we have both of those, where both of those are applicable, such as the cost of energy, we can calculate a, a single adjusted rate that combines those two rates together. So it takes into account both the escalation rate and the general inflation rate. And it produces what is the, the adjusted discount rate, this I prime. Uh, and then we use that in our factor calculations. And generally, we only use this for energy. RE is escal the escalation rate for energy. Um, and we often will use it for ma uh, maintenance as well. We'll look at how wages are rising. The wages in university tend to rise at about two to three percent a year. So you'll, you're paying your employees, faculty, and your university, you can forecast out, or in general, I'm, I'm gonna be paying people, giving them raises, two to three percent raises every year. And we do that with maintenance and operations costs as well. And generally, those numbers track the inflation rate. So the inflation rate is 4%. You assume an escalation rate of maintenance uh, will be 3 or 4%. And then there'll be a separate number, usually for energy, for electricity, and gas, and fuel, and fuel oil, and things like that. Um, so what happens is, if you have a... You know, in our analysis, we like to see you know the equal costs going going out for however many years our project is going to last. A typical HVAC project would be 15, 20, 25 years. And what we try to do in our cost analysis is come up with uh, 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 equal quantities that we can spread out across the life of the investment. Now, when you have inflation going on, instead of getting this, what you end up with is is something like this, so you time zero, and then you have inflation in the first year. So if maybe your cost is, is this in the first year, then the second year it's gonna inflate a little bit, and it's gonna inflate. So 
So your uh, your cost of energy or your cost of maintenance is going to trend. It's going to follow a trend that looks something like this. It's going to escalate. It's going to increase exponentially because it's going up by a percentage every year. So what we want to try to do is say, all right, well, I can't really do anything with that. That's hard to deal with. So what I'm going to do is, all right, this is this cost is escalating say two percent. Um, what I'm going to do is. I'm going to turn. I'm going to calculate an average that accurately reflects this six years of escalating costs, um, and that's what this formula does here. And it, it also takes into account the discount rate, and it produces a number that looks more looks like this. So it converts that exponentially increasing cost into a series of equal costs like that. And that you can deal with. Okay? Then you take this equal series of costs and you bring it to the present. You convert it to a present value and add it to your initial cost. That, that's what this method is doing here. It's taking up an exponentially you know, increasing value because of inflation and it's, 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 it's turning it into this ab, kind of an average value that's equal for the whole life of the of the investment. And uh, so you end up with this AF, which is equal uniform annual cost, where you multiply that first year, you take this cost here, or you take what the value is at time zero. So if I'm, you know, my this year my employees are getting a 2% increase, um, then I take that 2%, that 0.02, I don't take the I take the, the, the number, let's say it's, it's going to cost me $100. Uh, and I use that 100 multiplied by L, which I calculate here, and that will give me the adjusted, an adjusted figure that you know, maybe it'll be 120 that will be constant all the way across. Okay. It's really energy, energy costs that we're most concerned with um, and, 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 and make a big difference. Uh, another factor that comes, it's coming increasing into play, increasingly into play is the uh, is costs associated with carbon emissions, with pollution. Because uh, um, some places, uh, you know, for example, if there's a carbon tax, you would have to look at what your carbon emissions will be uh, in one year, and then if there's a tax on that, you have to apply that tax and figure out how that's going to affect your, your budget for that option. And if you're comparing that with an option that doesn't have any carbon emissions, then it might knock the, the former out of contention. If you're producing carbon emissions, it might drive the cost up to the point where it's not an attractive option. Um, there are also risks associated with going for projects that have uh, CO2 emissions or that use natural gas because uh, energy codes now are starting to put a ban or put, put limitations on systems that use those kinds of fuels. And so you might incur future costs that you can't really foresee at the moment. Um, and that's encouraging investments in uh, heat pumps or systems that use electricity rather than burning fuel. Yes? I wanted to ask for the CO2 tax, or is it assumed it's a certain amount per ton, or is it assumed that it's going to increase at a certain rate per year, if that makes sense? Would it be similar to inflation where it would assume that each year it's going to rise a certain amount, or is it just a consistent amount per ton? Or does it, 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 really, would it, it vary? The, would it depend on the code? Well, it depends on the, the country, okay. whether, whether there's a, a, a carbon tax there. I mean, this is really more of a factor in Europe and British Columbia, and I, I don't really know how those are being factored into the, their analyses. Um, so far, we haven't had to deal with that yet here. Um, what we do have to deal with is, is something I think maybe we saw in uh, citizen engineer is that 
there, there are certain tax benefits that come from choosing uh, energy systems that are have zero carbon emissions or that use solar or wind as, as opposed to fossil fuels or something uh, like that. Use a heat pump instead of a, of a natural gas heating system. And uh, so there's tax benefits. You can lower your taxes in a year. There's a way that you can factor that into the analysis. But we're not doing that. I, I chose not to okay. go into the tax side of it. Okay, yeah, thank you. I was just yeah. out of curiosity, are there tax incentives for some of the equipment? Yes. Or is it yeah. just, okay, so it's not just the larger energy side for a plant, but say if right. you get a heat pump in a certain application, there is a, yes. there, is a certain, there are incentives then? Yes. Okay. And, and they're variable depending on state and, and county probably yeah. as well. Okay, yeah. thank so you. It's hard to apply those set up. And yeah, I'm not even sure at the national level Because the laws are constantly yeah. changing and whatnot. So. Okay. Yeah, and the uh, the tax incentives for solar and wind are being phased out. I think it's so I think wind is almost gone, credit. right? Huh? Wind's almost. I think wind after this year is gone entirely. It, it may be. Yeah. 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 Sometimes they very get small. it gets renewed, and uh, but yeah, and those benefits can be significant. So you're talking 15, 20 percent or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Then it used to be 30 percent for solar panels. You get 30 percent investment tax credit. You're going to knock 30 percent off your your initial cost that first year, and that can be significant for you know business that puts in a lot of. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, let's let's tr uh, take a look at this first example, and that'll kind of show us how to apply these uh, these methods here. Uh, and uh, wow, I've got a is something that is really tickling my sinuses here and I feel like I'm on the verge of a meltdown a sneezing a sneezing fit Let's see if we can keep that in check here all right so we've got a system here I'm putting in an HVAC system we've got two options a deluxe and the standard option now this one's presented in a, a little bit different than uh, the usual. Instead of everything being a cost, we're actually evaluating the two systems in terms of their savings, energy savings relative to the current system, the system that the client is currently using. So for example, the deluxe model, high initial cost, relatively high maintenance cost, but high energy savings. So this is going to be a positive number in the cash flow. These others are negative. Well, this is positive at the end, end of life salvage value. But you can see here's a big savings. And the question we have we would have, want to ask is whether that energy savings, that big difference in energy savings over 15 years, will that will that compensate for the additional upfront cost here? It's a much more expensive system. Both options have a life of 15 years. It will scrap the equipment. The client says the discount rate is 8%. And we're forecasting maintenance costs to escalate at the inflation rate of 3.5% per year. Uh, energy savings are expected to remain constant. So we're just going to hold that savings constant over the 15 years. And we want to compute the life cycle cost for each of these systems and make a decision which one to go with based on that cost. And we're assuming both will do the job. Both meet the client's needs. It's a matter of choosing the one that is uh, the most economically attractive. So 
So how do we how do we do this? Okay. Um, so so here's what we have. We're gonna uh, our life cycle cost is gonna be a present value. So I'm going to call it P for present value, and we'll start, start with option one, which is the deluxe option. So there's going to be a cost. That's going to have a negative sign. That initial cost is 220000 And if that's all there was, then we would have a life cycle cost of negative $220,000. Uh, option two has an initial cost of 125000 And because these costs are at time zero, we don't have to do anything to them. We don't have to apply a factor to them because they're, they're already present values. They're already t equals zero values. So we draw the, uh, uh, the cash flow diagram here. At time zero, we have this big south, uh, what these generally look like is this big you know, initial cost. And then you, you, you have these uh, every year. And in, in, in most cases, there'll be a, a long series, a long period where these annual cash flows will be equal. You, know, you might have a replacement cost somewhere in the middle or, or some significant maintenance renovation that will be at a, a different cost. But we don't have that here. We just have this long series of equal uh, uh, payments and benefits. So we've got a uh, maintenance of 38,000. So we're going to have a and actually we're going to have something like this because our, our maintenance is escalating. And we get to the last year, 15. So we're going to have a maintenance cost that looks like this. So that's escalating at the inflation rate. But that's not how I'm going to bring this into my analysis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to levelize that. That's what we call this a levelizing factor. We're going to levelize that maintenance cost so that it's equal to the whole period. And that's going to be our uh, A and L all the way across. And then we're going to have savings. That's going to be a benefit. And that savings is going to be the same all the way across for this option one, 79000 All the way to year 15. And then in year 15, we're going to have an additional salvage value. So 16,000. So we're going to have the 79,000 plus 16,000 for the salvage here. And then we've got our, our maintenance, A A M L. Uh, what is that? What's that for? Huh? What is um, A M L? That for? This is the annual maintenance. That's this number here multiplied by the levelizing factor L. These are supposed to be equal. Okay? All right, so we've got our present value, or our initial cost, 220. Now we're going to add our, our energy savings. So that's a positive number. <coughs> but this is an annual stream of benefits. So to bring this to a present value, we have to multiply it by a factor. So that factor is going to be, we want 
present value given an annual stream. Okay? So we've got an annual stream of $7,900 at an interest rate of 8%. For 15 years. Okay? And then for this one, we have 43. Same thing, 8% over 15 years. All right, so we've got our initial cost and we have our benefit in terms of savings on energy. Now we have costs. We have our annual maintenance cost. That is going to be negative because it's a cost. And it's going to be this number. But that number is going to inflate every year. And we're going to have to levelize it. We're going to turn it into a constant annual amount that just repeats over 15 years. So it's going to be that annual maintenance cost times the levelizing factor. And then we're going to bring it to the present. And then we conclude with our end of life salvage. That's money coming in. So we add 16000 And that is a future. That's a single payment in the future. So it's an F. Uh, it's going to be a sorry. P given F, right? We, we want a P, and it's a given an F. And it is 8% uh, 15 years. So what we've done is we've taken this series of payments and benefits and converted it, by this calculation, converted it into a single number at time zero, right now. Okay. So we need to find out these numbers here. And to get these, we can use the formula, the formula that were in the notes. But And, and then I had a table for 6%. This is 8%. So I cheated. And instead of calculating the factors, I looked them up in uh, I went to the FE, <laughs> the, reference. the FE reference because they have a section that has the factor tables and actually the factor formula. So if you're in the FE prep class, um, if you go back to the first uh, class that I did when we did eco engineering economics, there's a section in the reference handbook that has all this stuff in there. And there's, a lot, there's more factors than I, I showed in my notes. But you know, I could I could calculate this P slash A. You'd have to use the equation. P slash A is uh, that one. So I, I could calculate it with that equation, but it's easier just to go to the eight percent table. So there's a table for eight percent, and. 15 years, P slash A for 15 years is uh, 3.8. It's, it's hidden behind there. Let's see. 15 years is 8.5595. Wait a second. That's not right. Is that right? P slash A. Number. 
this looks like. So 8% P slash A, 8.5595. And then for the P slash F, that's this column here for 15 is 0 0.3152. <coughs> Although for the life of me, I don't know where my I got the, the numbers here in my in my notes. Um, Well, anyway, we'll go what we see on the table with what we see on the table there. And we do the same thing here. And then our, our salvage value was 6,900. Okay, so we will be good to go, except we need to calculate this factor here. And for that, we use, we take into account the, the, the escalation So our discount rate was is 8%, so that's 0 0.08 is I. Our escalation rate for maintenance is 3.5%, the rate of inflation, so that's 0 0.035 over 1 plus 0 0.035. And that comes out to be 0 0.0435. So that's our I prime. And then our levelizing factor is A given P at is going to be A given P, and our discount rate is 8%, N is 15, and then A given P at our I prime, our adjusted discount rate, which is 4.35%, 15. Now this one, A, A slash P, 8% 15, we can get off the table. So we go back to our table at 8%. So now we want to get an annual amount given the present amount. So that's going to be 0.1168, A slash P at N equals 15. 0.1168, but then at 4.35 percent, there's no table for that. That's un it's in unavoidable. We're going to have to calculate what this is. So we have to look at what the factor formula is. A slash p, a given p. 
i, i plus 1 plus i to the n. Okay, so this is going to be equal to i 1 plus i to the n. It's capital recovery, so 1 plus i to the n minus 1. So if I plug in what that I prime is, 0.0435 times 1.0435 to the 15, and then the denominator, 1.0435 to the 15 minus 1, and what does this give us? 0.09216. So then that goes up here. And this means our, our uh, level levelizing factor is 1.27. 1.27. So what does that mean? It means that we've got this escalating maintenance cost. It's, it's, it's rising exponentially like this, starting at time zero at whatever the given value was. 38,000, we multiply 38,000 times this number here, and that will give us a single number, a single constant number that we can spread out all the way across 15 years, okay? So that means that for investment option one, this number here is gonna be 38,000 times 1.27, and down here it's gonna be 13,000 to 1.27. Okay, so it's now a constant number. So we just calculate these, and we'll have two numbers that we can compare. Two costs at time zero, and we can see which one is, is more expensive. Now, I'm going to have to calculate these because I, I used I used a wrong number for uh, piece PA here. So let's see what we got. Negative 220,000 two plus 79. Oops. Syntax error. Minus seven five plus sixteen thousand. So I get forty eight. One three one. That's my the present value of the life, life cycle cost of option one. That doesn't look too bad, considering what that initial cost is. That savings is kicking in over that over fifteen years, and it's really pulling that that cost down. And then for the second one. Start out with minus one two five two three, 
Oh, do we have to include the P over A for the, the maintenance cost as well? Yes. Okay. Getting uh, 103916 for this one. But I'm not confident in my calculations here because I'm doing it. Um, did somebody check these? Yeah, that's the same thing. Uh, so how did this, my numbers, uh, yeah, that's pretty close to what I, what I had in my notes, except I, I had this number, my, my number here was off, but I, I was really surprised at how much more expensive the second option is because of, you know, when you factor in that fuel savings, or the, 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 the energy savings, it really, uh, it really knocks down the cost of option one. So this can be a really important part of a, you know, of the overall analysis comparing two systems, two or more systems, to see which one you know is more economically desirable. That's a big difference. I, I I'm really surprised. Me. Um, anyway, uh, I, there's no time to do the second the second problem. The second problem is uh, based off of the the slides that I had here. Um, and it is mostly applying the formulas from the energy analysis. But anyway, if you want to, uh, if you want to hold off, you only have to turn into problem one. So if you want to hold off on problem two, we'll go over. Uh, I'll go over the example that matches that on. Uh, Monday, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. So how did you get the I prime there, 53.35? Uh, yes? Yeah, the, it's like P is equal to 3. Yeah, how did you get the I prime? Uh, the oh, that was here? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So it's a discount rate minus yeah. the escalation. Okay. And the maintenance one plus the estimation for the Makes sense. So, so I minus F M? I minus R M one plus R M? R M, okay.